My name is Christopher Shulgin. This is the Variance of Concern webinar. This is MedCan Presents, the webinar series that we do every two weeks. Today is April 6th, and this is timely. We're here with Dr. Aisha Khatib, the Clinical Director of Travel Medicine here at MedCan. And the counts have been, for the last three days, the counts have been at uh, approximately 3,000. And Dr. Khatib, well, first of all, why don't we just have a quick greetings and then we can talk about the situation where we're in. So how are you today? Great, thank you for having me on, uh, Chris, to talk about this very timely topic and with everything kind of going on in the city and in the province. Scary times ahead, it seems. You said, and I hope I'm fine to say this, but you said that you called 56 people yesterday to tell them that they were positive with COVID. Can you paint that picture for me a little bit? Where are you, like, where are you actually calling? What are people's reactions like? And then can you quantify that number for me a little bit? Like, give me a little bit of context. How unusual is it to call yeah. 56 people? Yeah, so, I mean, I work at one of the assessment centers in Toronto, um, and usually, uh, the physicians call back the positive cases that we see coming through. So every day we'll say anywhere between 200 to over 400 people coming through for testing. Um, and those results are back through to us usually the following day or the days following after that. Um, and then we as, as, uh, also go through and contact everybody um, to let them know about the results. Public health also does that to contact Trace. But um, on average, you know, the calls that we usually make can be anywhere between 10 to 25 calls. Um, the most I had ever done uh, was a couple of weeks ago was about 36. And so 55 calls or 56 calls in one day was pretty unprecedented um, for when you have test the numbers of testing coming through, that's about 400 if you actually calculate that out. It's about a posit uh, positivity rate of anywhere between eight to twelve percent at one at one testing center. So that's huge. Usually, we average anywhere between three to five percent for per, uh, percent positivity. So um, it's a little bit alarming, uh, and this just looks like it's going to keep going up from what we're seeing. Um, we do, so folks, we will take questions at the end. But um, Dr. Katib does have her presentation that walks us through how we've uh, arrived at this situation and then what to expect in the weeks to come in a, ver a couple of various different scenarios, basically. Um, so Dr. Kitty, before we get to your presentation and then the questions at the end, folks, you can ask questions by uh, using your chat function or the Q&A function on your Zoom uh, browser. Um, so 56, so if, and the percent positivity, basically that's double what you have been seeing, what you've expected, and, and actually double some of the highest that you've ever had. Um, what are people- Even more than double, yeah. That's, Sorry, yeah, go that's ahead, crazy. Chris. So what are people saying when you're calling them to tell them the news? Um, well, unfortunately, a lot of the people that we're calling um, are people who have potentially gotten it from work, where they're essential workers, where they had to go to work. Um, a lot of people, have had exposures through family gatherings, through friends, through positive um, roommates. Um, and then there's a huge percentage of people who just don't know where the exposure came from. Um, and they said that they've been following all the public health measures. They haven't gone anywhere except maybe the grocery store, the TTC, and that might've been their only potential exposure. Um, and so, you know, the, it's, it's variable. And also the symptoms are variable. We're seeing people who have very mild symptoms to people who are, we are advising even over the phone to go into the emergency um, to get checked up. So, um, you know, the, the actual, um, where these cases are coming from is variable, but it is evident um, that we are seeing a lot more um, in the essential worker group as well for people who have to go out to work who are potentially being exposed to these cases. Okay. So crazy times, basically. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. Sort of one more thing. Do you, do you have any sense how, what proportion of these people um, are B117 versus, uh, you know, P1 versus B1351 
versus just the normal COVID that we were used to, you know, six months ago? Yeah, so about um, as for this uh, COVID science table now, we're sitting at around 67% of all cases that we are seeing are variants of concern. Um, about 90% of those are the B117 or the UK variant. Um, and then a smaller percentage are going to be the B1351 or the, the P1. Although we are seeing um, higher numbers of the P1 now in Western Canada. So they've had outbreaks of that um, in BC and Alberta. And you might've heard of the Vancouver Canucks um, having an outbreak of the P1 and they're not doing so great either. Um, and so that looks like it seems to be almost spreading interprovincially now. So that is something um, that is being watched and a little bit worrisome as well. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into your presentation because I suspect that some of my questions are, are you know, taking, are, are, are taking the news from some of your uh, slides. So um, why don't sure. we take a minute, you can share your screen and then we can go from there. And folks, one more time, I'll just remind people that we can answer questions using the Q&A or the chat function. Dr. Khatib, take it away. Perfect, thank you very much, Chris. So um, as Chris um, stated, I'm basically going to be going through just doing a quick review of the COVID-19 variants of concern and giving an overview of essentially um, the situation that we're facing today in Ontario with the third wave um, that is predominantly being driven by these variants of concern. And it can be a little bit confusing because there's a lot of numbers and a lot of words being tossed around. So we'll try to clarify that a little bit for you today. So first of all, we're gonna talk about what a variant is. So essentially a variant is a virus that has changed or mutated. So we know that viruses replicate, that's what they do. So usually a virus, they infect a cell, um, they attach onto a cell and they infect it. When they infect it, they inject their, in, in the, the case of the coronavirus, their RNA and they replicate. Um, now, every time a virus replicates, it makes mistakes, okay? And those mistakes are called mutations or variants. Um, what happens with those mistakes um, is different. So sometimes it can have absolutely um, no repercussion, and it can just be um, a redundant mistake or mutation that has no impact on the virus. But sometimes uh, those mutations can be detrimental, and it can change the adaptation or the functioning of the virus. So, you know, variants and mutations are not abnormal. It is something that we see generally with viruses, especially with coronaviruses. And up until now, throughout the pandemic, there have been hundreds of variants um, that we have seen and that are being mapped. And you can imagine when you look when you're talking about a genetic code um, of a virus, it kind of um, there's different parts of that genetic code um, that can acquire these mutations. So what makes it a variant of concern? So a variant becomes a variant of concern when the changes that have made have been made because of the mutation that has happened has either a clinical or a public health significant impact that can either affect um, the transmissibility um, or the ability to spread for that virus, um, the virulence or the severity of disease that that virus may present with. Um, it can have an impact on the vaccine effectiveness as you may have um, been hearing about. Um, it can also affect the diagnostic testing capabilities that we have in order to be able to detect these uh, variants um, or these viruses that have had these mutations. So these are the, um, the main things that we look at um, in regards to what makes um, a variant uh, you know, more concerning is when it actually has an impact um, clinically or through public health. So up until now, there, like I said, there have been many variants that we have seen throughout this pandemic, but there are three key variants of concern um, that have been identified globally and that are currently in Ontario. These include the B117 variant, and this was first identified um, in Kent, the United Kingdom, back in September of 2020. Um, there's the B1351 variant, and this was first identified 
in South Africa back in October. And the, there's also the P1 variant, which was identified in Japan as well as in Brazil um, back in December. Now these variants um, are mutations that have happened independently of each other and they are they they are derived um, I know everyone calls them the UK variant or the South African variant so it's basically based on the origin of where the variant was first described or identified so when we talk about these three specific variants of concern um, there's certain mutations that have been recognized in these variants um, that are impacting the way that this virus is acting. So compared to earlier variants of COVID-19 that we've seen earlier in the pandemic, what we're seeing with these particular variants is um, specifically increased transmissibility or the higher capability to infect. Uh, and the mutation that's responsible for that is the N501Y mutation. And that is a mutation of the area of the virus that's called the receptor binding um, uh, zone. And basically that essentially makes the virus more capable of infecting a cell. So whether it's able to latch on or attach to the cell better, or it becomes more sticky, um, it basically uh, results in increased transmission of the virus compared to um, the capability of what it was able to do before. The difference between the B117 variant and the two other um, uh, variants uh, derived from South Africa and from Brazil is there's another mutation called the E484K mutations that are not on the B117. These are also referred to as the EEC uh, mutations. And this mutation is actually specifically on the S gene or the spike gene of the uh, coronavirus. Um, and why this is significant is that there's a couple of reasons. So that the, ice, the, the spike gene mutation um, essentially affects the spike protein on the outer uh, of the virus capsule. And what this particularly does is it allows um, the attachment of the virus to a cell to replicate. Um, and it also is the target for our vaccine. So our vaccines uh, create these spike proteins um, with, um, through genetic coding um, or basically through the, the, the way the vaccines are created. And what it does is it allows our body's immune system to create a memory or imprint of the spike protein. So the problem is that if these variants are mutating that specific um, creation of that spike protein and changing it so it's not as recognizable by our body's ability to recognize it, you get something called a, almost like an immune escape or an immune evasion where you may have decreased effectiveness of the vaccine um, and its ability to create immunity towards viruses that are present. So what's the main concern in regards to that? So there's a few. So the increased transmissibility is a, is a concern. So what we're seeing is the numbers shooting up. And the reason for that is with these mutations and these variants, we're seeing up to 50% increased transmissibility. There is question as well as whether the uh, virus has been changed to be more severe in regards to the presentation of symptoms. This is still unclear. Um, there have been some limited studies showing that the severity can be increased to up to 30%. And the actual mechanism of how the virus is able to create more severity and in infection is still also being investigated. The other idea that this um, the, that the, we're getting more severe cases is just from the sheer um, fact that we're getting increased transmissibility. So by increased transmissibility, we're getting more cases. And just by the sheer volume of increased case counts, we would expect to see proportionally increased, um, more increased severe cases, hospitalizations, um, and, and mortality. And as a result, that's also what we're seeing is an increased risk of hospitalization and mortality. Um, there is talk of risk of decreased vaccine effectiveness, and we'll, we'll um, discuss that a little bit further um, 
in the presentation. And at the moment, the other thing is that the new variants of concern now account for 67% of Ontario's uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections. Now that's fast. What, one of the things that made this variant, the B117, you know, that flagged so quickly is in the UK, we saw this variant take hold between November and December. And within two months, it became the dominant circulating um, virus um, variant um, within the UK. That is very, very fast in regards to replication and transmission. And even for us here in Ontario, uh, just two weeks ago, we were sitting at talking about the variants of concern being 40% of case counts. And now today we're sitting at almost 70%. So with the B117 likely to being the predominant one to take over in the next couple of weeks. The other concern is that we're, we are seeing younger Ontarians ending up in hospital that we weren't seeing earlier in this pandemic. The risk of ICU admission is two times higher with these variants and the risk of death um, is 1.5 times higher for the B117 compared to the earlier variants that we were seeing earlier in the pandemic. So as you can see, um, this graph shows uh, COVID-19 daily cases and deaths um, in Ontario. And we talk about the third wave. So we had the first wave, you know, last year, we had the second wave, um, you know, in between December, and January, and we came down um, with the stay at home orders here and lockdown orders. And then we are clearly up, going back up into another wave. The trajectory seems to be higher and we seem to be um, higher numbers than we were uh, then we were at the potential peak of the second wave. So um, this is where we stand in regards to the third wave. What's different about this compared to the other waves though, is that the variants of concern are the dominating um, uh, of variants that are circulating. So these are the earlier variants that we saw back um, in December and January. And when the stay at home order was um, implemented back in January 12th, we saw a sharp decrease in daily uh, rate of new cases. And that seemed to trend down um, and stay down with the public health measures that were put in place. Unfortunately, what we also saw kind of happen at that time was that these new variants started circulating. And now, even though the variants, the early variants had come down, at the same time we were seeing these new variants of concern start to go up. And so what that means is that we actually have two pandemics happening. So there's two different circulating um, um, you know, COVID-19 pandemics that we're, what we're looking at. We have the earlier variants that we're used to that our public health measures that we, you know, are masking, our distancing, our lockdown seem to be working um, in regards to bringing down that curve. And then we have these new variants of concern, which are seemingly, you know, um, exponentially growing um, compared to the variants that we had earlier. And they are, um, the numbers are much higher and the transmission rate is, is much um, faster and higher than the earlier variants that were. As a result, you can see the case counts that we're looking at, for example, just yesterday was 2,000 um, of the 3,000 cases that we're seeing in Ontario were variants of concern compared to the earlier variants. So we're seeing about a 67% out of all cases um, variants of concern, and very soon we'll see this as the dominant variant. The other thing that's concerning is that these con uh, variants have more severe consequences that are more fatal. So we are seeing now um, in the hospitals, we're seeing this in the media, we're seeing this from doctors um, who are dealing with these, that compared to people infected with the early variants, more people are being hospitalized. Um, and admitted to ICU, and more people are dying if they're actually infected with the variants of concern compared to the earlier variants. The other thing that we're seeing, oh, sorry, let me just move this here, is that this is the current situation um, in, in Canada. So in the last week we're seeing, including today's case counts of over 3,000, we have about 21,000 new cases of COVID. They have identified about 14,000 um, of the cases out of this 
across Canada being variants, but remember the variants do take a couple of weeks to sequence. So they are maybe recognized, but they do take a while to actually be identified. And so there may be a backlog of the numbers that we're actually um, showing to represent um, what's actually happening. Now I just kind of want to show this map, uh, this graph, because I think it's really important to see who in um, Canada is getting COVID. So we have had, you know, this vaccination of, of those over the age of 75 and people in long-term care. And we have seen those numbers really drop off in regards to deaths in long-term care um, and, and hospitalization and deaths in that age group. But the actual age distribution of COVID cases that we are seeing in Canada currently are, you know, less than the age of 60 with a predominant um, focus more in the, in the younger age groups. And the thing that's worrisome about that now is that we're actually getting younger people um, admitted to the ICU and to the hospitalization. So this is a graph comparing uh, the ICU admissions by age by date. Um, and so back in December, we were seeing, you know, the predominant um, um, admissions were in those over the age of 60. That has now increased by about 50% to those under the age of 50 in the last few weeks, um, as well as the fact that we're seeing up to 20% more hospitalizations in these younger age groups. So what can we expect? Um, so this is actually from the Ontario Science Table where they do projections, um, kind of looking at potentially where we would be in regards to modeling for different scenarios. So what we have here is the expectation if there's absolutely no intervention done in the next few weeks, where we would expect to see case counts. And the projection for that would be anywhere between, you know, five to 10,000 in the next few weeks, if nothing were to be done, um, with the assumption that you have the um, transmission rate over 50% higher um, with a replication time of about 11 days, like a doubling time in case numbers of about 11 days. You can see here that um, with just vaccination, we would have a decrease potentially of um, cases that we would be seeing circulating. And that's the assumption that, you know, the vaccines are being administered constantly and, and um, with uh, about 70% effectiveness. And then the bottom um, curves actually show uh, projections in regards to what would happen if there were two, uh, a two week stay at home order versus a four week stay at home order, or a, what we call like a circuit breaker, a way to basically decrease or stop the transmission um, of, of the uh, circulating variant. Similarly, um, the ICU projections really depend on, you know, systemic led um, public health measures that potentially could be implemented. Now, one of the things that we're seeing here is that even with the stay at home orders and the vaccines on board, you know, that will help flatten the curve, but it's not really going to bring it down sharply right away, right? So, you know, um, I think one of the things is we're talking about vaccines really kind of getting us out of this situation um, of the third wave and kind of this impending um, overwhelming surge that we're expecting in the healthcare system. Um, but it almost seems like it might be a, a little too late in the fact that the vaccines are not actually being delivered at... Um, a high enough number to potentially effectively really bring that down. So this may um, last a little bit longer, and I think we really need to use all the mitigation strategies that we have, including you know um, the the lockdown, the stay-at-home orders, people really um, ensuring they're um, following public health measures with the distancing, masking, minimizing social socializing, and still also getting vaccinations. And I think the vaccines are a key thing here. We really need to get them into the um, those the younger age groups, those who are in the highest uh, vulnerable populations and the highest risk potentially um, of getting COVID. So these are the current numbers right now. Um, as of today, there's 497 in the ICU. This is a, m higher than the highest that um, there was even during the wave two. So what about vaccines um, as a strategy? And this is just 
basically an illustration of how the vaccines work. So the vaccines either um, um, inject a genetic uh, RNA code or a viral vector, which carries the information to create these spike proteins on the, your cells. And then the body creates these neutralizing antibodies so as part of your immune system, which then um, uh, what we call neutralizes the virus um, from causing symptoms um, and potential transmission. So how these vi uh, vaccines work, or this is basically what we're seeing as the efficacy rate for the different vaccines. The one thing to consider about what these efficacy rates mean is that these rates mean how well does this vaccine decrease your risk of have, being sick compared to if you did not have the vaccine? So how does it decrease your risk of becoming symptomatic and having symptoms, uh, having um, um, uh, COVID, not necessarily transmission, but you can see it's actually quite effective, um, especially in the mRNA vaccines. And as we're seeing in, in real life now with AstraZeneca deaths, and these numbers are actually higher and more likely along the lines of 81% um, and 71%. So what's the concern is that these spike mutations can reduce the ability of these vaccines or natural immunity from COVID, just getting it itself to neutralize that virus. But I think it's really important for people to understand that, oh, you know, it's not an all or nothing thing. And it may actually you know, decrease the protection or the effectiveness of the vaccine. So for example, if we're talking about an mRNA vaccine being 95% effective, maybe, you know, the fact that it's not, um, you, the, these variants are not as recognized by these vaccines, it can bring it down to maybe 70% effectiveness, but that doesn't mean it's completely not effective. It just means that you may still have partial protection. Um, and that, that reduced efficacy does not necessarily mean resistance to the vaccine as well. So you're still going to get benefits of having a vaccine on board against these variants. The other really key thing is that vaccines are really still effective, excellently effective against the dominant B117 that's circulating right now. And that's going to be a key measure in really driving down transmission and driving down cases um, during this wave. Um, when you're getting the vaccine, you're going to have less symptoms. You're going to have less um, virus, infectious um, virus being spread and transmitted to others. And as a, as a result, you're going to have less um, cells being infected, less virus being able to replicate. And so you actually will get a less potential for these uh, new mutations to form and less risk of new uh, variants emerging. And as such, you also would get less issues with having vaccine challenges in the future. The key thing to recognize here is that these variants pop up kind of regionally. So it's really important that there's this global concerted effort in, in regards to vaccine equity, because you may have one country or two countries that are completely protected um, from their vaccine. But if something um, emerges you know, on the other side of the world and with travel, um, how well protected is that population going to be if that, vac or if that variant potentially has the ability to um, evade the immune system? Them, um, or uh, the specific mutation that makes the vaccine less effective. The other really key thing to remember is that the efficacy rates aren't necessarily what we really want to look at. These numbers are the ones that we want to look at. And all the viruses, all the vaccines, sorry, are almost 100% effective in protecting you from severe disease, which means hospitalization and death. So this is really key um, in regards to looking at um, the different vaccines. And I know there's a lot of talk about vaccine shopping and which vaccines better. I think one of the key things we need to remember is that these vaccines, they're not an individual treatment modality, okay? They are a public health intervention. And at the moment, these vaccines are necessary to drive down cases as fast as possible to decrease a surge and overwhelming our healthcare system so that you have less hospitalizations and you have less severe disease and less death. And as you can see, all the vaccines are gonna be effective in being able to do that almost 100% with Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca. And so really when that people ask me, you know, which vaccine should I get? Or I'm gonna wait for this vaccine. I'm gonna wait for that vaccine. 
you know, with everything going on right now, with the numbers going up, with these variants circulating, and the risk of hospitalization, the risk of ICU, and the risk of death increasing, what I say to people is the best vaccine is the first one that's available to you and the first one that you can get into your arm. So far, only 6 million people have had a vaccine administered in Canada. It's about 15%. So really, that's not as an effective strategy as yet to really help bring down these variants of this transmission. So we really need to get more people vaccinated as fast as possible. Um, you know, and over, over 6.5 million people in the world have now been vaccinated. The other thing to think about with these vaccines is Pfizer and Moderna were not studied when these variants were around. Um, whereas AstraZeneca and Janssen are more recently studied with when the variants were circulating. So there may need to be boosters or modifications made in the future in regards to future variants or variants that may be less effective against the vaccine. And those are being developed um, by the different um, um, companies currently. Um, the, also is the data of durability is not yet known. So there's a lot of studies that are being followed up with these, but given the current situation, um, you know, if the vaccine becomes available of, uh, to you, you really want to get it on board to really help protect yourself and potentially those around you, right? Because you're more likely to be less likely to transmitting virus to others. Now, I know there's a lot of questions about safety and the AstraZeneca vaccine particularly. So NACI um, has recently um, recommended that um, those under 55 in Canada should not be getting the AstraZeneca. And the concern was in regards to um, atypical blood clots, which they're now calling VIPIT, that were um, being, um, um, that there was initial data from, from people who were receiving the AstraZeneca. These blood clots were between the ages of, of 20 to 55 and predominantly in women. The absolute risk of this blood, these blood clots um, was about one in a million, or is being calculated about one in a million. In the German study that was released, it was about one in 100,000. Now you compare that to risk from death from COVID-19, and that comes to about two uh, over 10,000. So the risk of you know, complications or death from COVID-19 really is a lot higher than um, the potential risk from um, these blood clots. The, there is there's discussion and, and they're looking at maybe potentially birth control use in those women um, in those studies may contribute to a little bit of increased risk. Again, the risk was quite small and about 29 out of 3 million, um, but it is a factor that they're looking at. If you look at just birth control in general and increased risk of blood clot, that in the general population is about one out of 3,000. Um, that's not even looking at, um, you know, COVID itself. So, for those who've had the AstraZeneca vaccine already um, and are worried about it, you know, the, the risk of clots, very rare, the very rare risk of clots that we're seeing, we're usually seeing between day four and day 20 post vaccine. Um, there have been no reported um, cases um, after day 20, but for anyone who has had the vaccine specifically under the age of 55, if you develop any symptoms such as bruising, bleeding, chest pain, leg swelling, abdominal pain or headache, make sure you seek medical attention. But again, the cases have been very rare um, and it's been five cases out of 11 million. There haven't been any cases over 55 and that's why it continues to be a safe and effective vaccine for those who are over the age of 55, if that's the vaccine available to you. Remember, we are looking at the risk of a rare blood clot potentially versus the risk of blood clots and thromboembolism that you can get from COVID, and that's much higher. And the chances of dying from COVID-19 is about 50 times higher than getting a, a blood clot um, from the AstraZeneca vaccine within those um, risk factors that um, I mentioned. So it's still a good vaccine um, and it's excellent in regards to protection from severity um, of illness against COVID-19, hospitalization and death. So if that's the vaccine that's available to you first, um, I would still highly recommend um, getting that um, for protection given the situation that we're going into right now, which is a public health emergency. So in Canada, we've reached over a million cases. Um, you know, this happened over the weekend and, and out of those million, one in 41 Canadians have died from COVID-19. So there's been a total of 23,000 deaths. 
The variants now make up to about 70% of the cases, and ICUs are pretty much at capacity. They're starting to shuttle patients out to um, other areas of the province to make more room for the ICUs and kind of the hotspot centers. The rise in cases is concerning, um, especially because of the potential surge that we're um, expecting um, in the healthcare system, but also the fact that, you know, our, we have a very partially vaccinated population. So it's really important that there is a push to get um, these vaccines um, into people's arms as fast as possible to really bring down these case counts um, and the transmission to decrease um, potential hospitalization uh, complications and deaths um, for those who are in the most vulnerable populations at this moment. Remember, every time there's transmission, these viruses can mutate. Every time um, you know, somebody's infected, there's, there's risk of a mutation. And these viruses change rapidly. So things may be different in a few months. So we really need to act fast on this. Um, but remember that these new variants spread the same way as the original COVID-19 um, variant. So it's really not the time to let up on, on the public health measures that we have been using up until now. We need to really maintain our distancing, continue with effective mask wearing. We really need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, and have the, if you have the opportunity to get your vaccine, to get it on board. Um, and different ways to, you know, these are the ways to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 variants concern that we're seeing. So it's not anything new. These are not the measures that we, you know, anything new that we haven't been doing up until now or heard up until now. We really need to avoid social gatherings, you know, really going out for essential purposes, maintaining our distance, keeping wearing our, our masks, washing our hands often, avoiding crowded spaces and enclosed spaces. You know, being outside is safer. Um, you know, it's okay to get some fresh air. It's okay to be outside. There's, there's less risk of transmission outside in less crowded spaces. Um, but also if you're having symptoms, if you're not feeling well, get tested and stay home, right? And isolate from people because this is way more transmissible and infectious to other people. So you could be putting other people at risk as well and get the vaccine as soon as it's available to you. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, so thank you for paying attention today and I hope you all stay safe and get vaccinated when the opportunity arises for you. Uh, Dr. Khatib, thank you so much. Uh, can you, the, so the one um, uh, thing that I had the question on was the, so it, it sounds like you are hopeful that the vaccines get us out of this, uh, with based on the current distribution of the variants of concern. And you had that one uh, slide that you showed. Can we go back to that that shows uh, the point that if current the current situation continues essentially, that things start to go down? Yes. So um, how long, how far out is that prediction? So the, the curve, the green curve starts to go down. That's with four weeks a four week stay at home order essentially, right? Yeah, so remember the infection and incubation period for these viruses um, can be, it usually it's 14 days and with the variants we're seeing kind of transmission happen between 14 to 28 days. So when we're looking at a two week versus a four week, we're looking at incorporating that incubation period of these viruses. So if for example, somebody is infected with a virus or has been exposed to a virus, how long do they need to stay home or lock down to prevent them from passing that on to somebody else? So you kind of yeah. just let that virus fizzle out, right? Before they break their isolation so that they can kind of continue on. And so that's one of the reasons um, that we use this lockdown measure, the stay at home measure, is to really break that circuit of transmission. Um, and that's why there's so much em emphasis on people staying away from other people, um, staying away from groups during that time, um, specifically so that it, it can really decrease the transmission to other people. Because, you know, compared to the var other variants, you know, you're, you're, you're infecting 50% more people. So, for example, if you were one person was infecting two people before, now you're infecting three to four people. For one person and then those four people infect another four people and so it's an exponential growth that you're getting these shoot up in and, and so if you can actually block 
that transmission from even happening, then you're not going to get these exponential numbers that you see in these graphs. So, okay. So, and, and it's a little difficult to see, but is that around four? Okay. So four, it looks like it's around 410 that the number starts to decrease again, based on a four week stay at home order. So, so April 10th around that, uh, I mean, I, I just, you know, things do seem pretty dark. I just want to like, yeah, and yeah. And I just can end on a, on a bit of a happy note. It's that if the vaccines continue at the current rate and if yeah. uh, everybody is responsible, I'm not saying, you know, everybody, uh, this isn't, you know, this isn't a recipe to go outside and not socially distance, but this is, we, we do see a light at the end of the tunnel based on the current distribution of vaccines and that light at the end of the tunnel is, is kind of mid, mid-April, mid where it starts to go down again? For, for sure. I mean, and we, I don't want to really paint this grim picture because, you know, vaccines are, you know, they're very hopeful for us. And we see these examples of what the vaccines have done in Israel, what the vaccines have done in UK, where, you know, they've just dropped the transmission right off, right? They're not getting these circulating viruses and variants. And their transmission numbers have gone right down. And that's the, the benefit of vaccination. So what we really need to do is use these public health measures to try to decrease or mitigate the transmission while we're vaccinating as many people. So it's kind of a, a multi-pronged approach to really just cut that transmission so that we can kind of enter the summer where we can actually have you know, a summer that's a little bit more relaxed and a summer where we're not having as much transmission, where we're not feeling this urgency um, and kind of this overload. So yeah, so, you know, it, it, these projections are from the Ontario table and this was based on the briefing that they had last week. If, for example, if there's a two week versus a four week, where, when would we start to see this? Now these are projections based on cases, right? What we're seeing in the hospitals for ICUs and deaths and mortality, those are going to be lagging numbers. So we might see these cases start to drop off, but those numbers might rise and then start to fall off later. And so hopefully by the summertime when we get, you know, there, there are shiploads of, of vaccines coming in and the vaccine mm -hmm. um, deployment, you know, hopefully will be hitting a lot more people they're going to be hitting younger people, um, those who are more vulnerable. So hopefully we'll, we'll see less transmission, less infection, um, and hopefully that we can, you know, start to kind of go back to a, or start planning for, you know, a, a new normal kind of with the post pandemic. Because yes, the vaccines are what's really going to get us out of this pandemic, for sure. Um, but I think what's important is going to be, um, um, you know, maintaining those public health measures in the meantime while we can get everybody vaccinated. Fantastic. Uh, okay, well, this is great. Uh, if you would uh, stop sharing your screen, I can share my screen and I can just kind of wrap up based on um, how things are. We're a little over time. So, uh, so some of the questions we won't be able to get to, but I think everything was in the presentation. That was an amazing presentation and amazingly current and amazingly uh, uh, informative. So gosh, uh, really thanks thanks for that, Dr. Khatib. I okay, thanks, will, um, okay, so so where to find these webinars? So this is the medcan.com page. You go over to listen, watch, and learn from Medcan experts, click on podcasts and webinars. We're gonna go there and we post our webinars um, on this listen, watch, and learn page. Uh, this So this webinar will be right here and that'll take you to the YouTube page, which is um, youtube.com slash medcan live well, but you can easily find it from the medcan.com page. These are future webinars uh, coming up. This will get changed to the benefits of plant-based eating for everyone, which is April 20th. Les, that's uh, Global Mail nutrition columnist, Leslie Beck. She will be talking about uh, two days before Earth Day. She'll be talking about the benefits for the Earth as well as your own health, uh, plant-based eating. So reducing red meat in your diet and figuring out how to get more lentils, how to get more um, uh, plant-based options in your, in your eating. And so you can register on the MedCan uh, page. Now, let me stop that share. Now I'm going to move on 
to PowerPoint. Okay, so we've got this webinar and then um, other resources. So the current most uh, uh, relevant or most current, most recently posted um, MedCan presents other resources is the Eat, Move, Think podcast, episode 60. That's the new 10,000 steps with Ray Zahab. That's host Sean Francis. That's MedCan's uh, CEO talking about adventurer and ultra marathon runner Ray Zahab and about the many stress busting uh, benefits of outside. So that's, if there's one solace in all of this, it's that the third wave is happening in spring where actually in, at least in Toronto, and I think in most of the country, the weather is improving and it is, um, uh, it, it's okay to get outside for exercise, uh, socially distance, you know, stay away from people, but get out there, get in the sunlight and exercise uh, for your mental wellness. That's really important. That's it uh, for me, Dr. Khatib. Thanks so much. Webinar attendees. Thanks so much. Facebook live attendees. Thanks very much. Have a great week, everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Take care. Okay, bye.